Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, uh, carpal tunnel and whether it's uh, AOE, COE, or a bunch of baloney. And I think those it's kind of a rhetorical question. I think the answer is both, but overall, largely baloney when we try to connect it to to the workplace. So let's get on with it. Is it really AOE, COE? Here's some examples of false assumptions. Carpal tunnel is usually work-related. That's absolutely not true, and hopefully I'll be able to convince you of that by the end of today's presentation. DDD is due to a continuous trauma. Common medical diseases we see that claimed, at, claimed to be AOE, COE um, are not actually work-related. And to actually think about this. Think about this in terms of DDD. Think of this in terms of carpal tunnel, which is really this um, activity of uh, that we're going to start the in disease that we're going to talk about today. Why in athletics do we encourage activity, we encourage exercise, and all of a sudden when activity and exercise are part of the workaday world, it's, uh, it's injurious. It simply does not make any sense. Here's the uh, ASSH's position on CTs and repetitive strange injury injuries, and I just want to read the whole thing. Uh, the ASS of the hand is concerned with that, that patients with upper extremity pain are being assigned specific diagnoses on the basis of subjective complaints without objective physical findings. I know we've all seen that in some of our files. There is also a tendency to assign a causal relationship to work for this pain when there's a lack of epidemiological evidence. I think we've all seen that as well. As part of our normal process of providing the best care for our patients, it's important for the diagnosis to be accurate and the assignment of causation to be accurate. In short, doctor, Please just don't tell us, tell us it's work-related because they were at the job. Continuing, the, ASSA, the ASSH feels that a diagnosis of, quote, cumulative trauma disorder and, quote, repetitive strain disorder are not appropriate and may actually lead to the patient uh, lead the patient to believe he or she has a condition that is something more than ordinary aches and pains. In short, it's not doctor uh, and applicant counsel. It's just it's not necessarily just taking advantage of an employment or uh, of an employment situation to make money. It's actually physically injurious potentially to the innocent applicant. CTS is only second to the uh, is second uh, in terms of lost time cases. I suspect, suspect your caseload will reflect exactly that. Claimants tend to be older, surprise, surprise, paid more, surprise, surprise, and therefore, it's carpal tunnel are going to be largely max, max earners. I'm sure you're aware of this, but let's state the obvious. Continue, or, uh, CTS surgery drives up average costs. By how much? Well, here are some of the numbers we see. On the cheap end, from $1,500 to up to $1,200 for a carpal tunnel release. And we're going to talk about a couple, couple of different kinds of carpal tunnel releases later. Doctors are not getting the histories and exams correct, and they're not performing the correct tests, um, according to a paper um, discussing a RAND study. Uh, by the way, if you Google carpal tunnel and work-related, you'll find in almost an infinite number of studies, um, journal articles, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so when you're preparing, for example, for a doctor deposition and need to make a point or come, kind of catch the doctor unawares, uh, Googling can be very, very valuable. Uh, we talked about here getting tests properly performed. We will talk about some of the tests um, that are highly relevant in diagnosing carpal tunnel. So here's our formal diagnosis for carpal tunnel. Quote, a complex, a complex of symptoms resulting from keep that. I can't talk today. So this is weird. A complex of symptoms resulting from compression of the median nerve in the carpal tunnel with pain and burning or tingling paresthesis in the fingers and hand, sometimes extending to the elbow. Um, and we'll get a lot further detail. So in the hand, what, what do we have? We have radial, we have ulnar, and we have the median, most importantly, nerve. So why is it called carpal tunnel? because it actually does look like a tunnel. Um, here we go. We have the median nerve right here running through the tunnel that is made up of carpal bones. You can see them all down there. There's, there's four of them. And over here is the transverse carpal ligament. 
that's the thing that needs to be released when we have the carpal tunnel syndrome. In other words, the tightness over the median nerve that causes a disruption um, or inter, um, of the uh, nerve, median nerve's uh, impact on the fingers and palm. So what does this tunnel include? As I suggested, there's a U-shaped cluster of eight bones at the base of the palm and at the floor of the tunnel and the ligament across the, arching across the bone making up the top of the tunnel. Here's where the, the branches uh, or the nerve, the median nerve innervates uh, the various parts of the hand. And it controls the palm side of the thumb, the index finger, the middle finger, half of the ring finger, or this area here, the purplish area, um, which, uh, brings to mind the fact that when you're looking at the doctor's report or if the pain of the doctor's records, which I definitely recommend, and are looking at a pain um, um, picture where the applicant fills in where the pin, uh, pins and needles are, where the pain is, where the loss of sensation is, check out to see whether the applicant's complaints really do follow this pattern. Because oftentimes they'll uh, claim it's the entire hand, the entire upper extremity, um, and all of the fingers, um, et cetera. And that simply does not make medical sense. So what causes this condition? As I suggested, anything that impinges upon the nerve root. In other words, anything that reduces the space of um, through which the median nerve goes. Uh, anything, absolutely anything from bone spurs to, to tendon swelling. So what are the, some, of some of the conditions that can cause this? Repetitive, forceful grasping of the hand. That may be industrial. It may not be industrial. Repetitive bending of the wrist. May be industrial, may not be industrial. By the way, I'm talking about significant bending, not that which, caused, uh, that which is required for typing, uh, old school, or uh, keyboarding. Hormonal changes, presumably this is not going to be work-related. Arthritis, highly unlikely that it's work-related, and 46 million Americans are currently living with arthritis, uh, meaning that um, the, a large segment of our population, particularly those who, uh, the elderly, um, are, uh, have a significant causation or causal component uh, for carpal tunnel syndrome that is not work-related. It's the leading cause of disability in this country. And that's from the Centers for Disease Control, the CDC. What else can cause carpal tunnel? Diabetes, highly unlikely um, to be work-related unless you're working as a candy taster at C's Candy. Thyroid imbalance, once again, highly unlikely to be industrial. Broken or dislocated bones in the wrist area. Okay. That may, may be industrial, it may not be industrial. That's easy to determine. Tunnel size, the size of the carpal tunnel itself. Um, industrial, no, not, not at all. The size of your wrist is irrelevant. It's actually the tunnel size that you were born with. And I'm not talking about swelling um, or fractures or anything like that. It's just the actual size of the tunnel that you were born with. Uh, which interest, which is a, a, something that we should consider when we're thinking about apportionment, if indeed the doctor finds the carpal tunnel be work-related, which by the end of this presentation, I hope to have convinced you, uh, will probably be an erroneous con uh, conclusion. Heredity um, is also a major contributor to carpal tunnel. And remember, we have a recent, carp we have a recent district court of appeal decision that tells us that we can apportion to genetics. The WCJ and the WCAB held that we couldn't, but luckily the Court of Appeal swooped in and said absolutely positively, you can apportion to genetics. Um, get this, half of the cases of carpal tunnel, um, our um, genes account for them. Interestingly, according to Harvard, and you might have heard of Harvard, they're a small community college back east, uh, studies show a much higher risk for women who have an identical twin with the same disorder. So clearly there's a genetic component. Metabolic disease, 
diseases such as diabetes and thyroid disease, once again, highly unlikely that these are going to be considered AOE-COE. Autoimmune disease, not AOE-COE, like rheumatoid arthritis and lupus, and connective tissue disorders. Um, great questions for the doctor's deposition. Pregnancy, well, if this is work-related, we've got a bigger problem than carpal tunnel. Uh, this is a wide range of numbers, but this is um, as specific as I was able to get. 20 to 60 percent of pregnant women develop carpal tunnel. I've no, I've noted that a significant portion of the a proportion of the cases that I handle um, uh, in workers' compensation um, involve pregnant women. Interestingly, you might note that the uh, with the delivery of the child shortly thereafter, the carpal tunnel disappears as does the swelling in the woman's body, which uh, is not, which is cause and effect. Hormonal changes other than pregnancy too applies and may cause carpal tunnel and is highly unlikely to be work-related, such as an ovary or surgical menopause. Body weight, um, as I look at myself in the mirror, I realize that I am a candidate for carpal tunnel. Highly unlikely that it's an industrial. I can't claim that mine is, but being overweight or obese will double your risk of carpal tunnel. And this is American as apple pie and McDonald's um, from 76 and 80 to 203, 2003 and 2004. We increased obesity in this country from 15% to uh, one third. One third of us are obese. Ergo, one third of us are um, uh, open to carpal tunnel based upon that one condition alone. Other con con uh, uh, possible factors, as I suggested, genetics, age, obesity, gender. I just wanted to give you this on one page, smoking, and um, check out this language from the guide's newsletter. Medical literature suggests in most cases, that's most cases, Previously labeled as occupationally related uh, were neither caused nor aggravated by work. You might want to cite that uh, in your doctor deposition or in your letter to the doctor. Contrary to popularly held belief, there is no strong scientific evidence uh, that links computer use to carpal tunnel syndrome. Who said that? Was it the defense bar? Nope. Was it the insurance company or a group of employers? Nope. What radical employee hating out that made this preposterous claim? It was the Mayo Clinic. And it was Harvard Press. Also, up to two thirds of folks with presumed occupational carpal tunnel were found to have other medical conditions capable of actually causing the CTS. Now, I'm absolutely certain that two thirds of your carpal tunnel cases do not have doctors saying it's not work related. That's um, the onus is therefore on us to provide the literature, to provide the studies, to provide the stats and uh, the stats and figures to the doctors to explain to them why their uh, diagnosis is wrong, to demonstrate that we're on the ball and we, we know what they're talking about. And should we lose the AOE COE component of the of the argument, we certainly should be expecting a significant amount of um, apportionment. Check this out. A study of 5,600 workers found that computer use does not pose any risk of carpal tunnel. And that's from the folks who brought you the AMA guides through the evaluation of permanent impairment, JAMA, um, 2003. Another thought, a recent study showed that, quote, unquote, heavy computer users, those who worked on computers seven hours a day, just basically inputting of, of uh, information did not face any increased risk of carpal tunnel syndrome. And that's from Neurology, which is the official journal of the American Academy of Neurology. Let that, let that sink in. Heavy computer users, no increase in the risk of carpal tunnel. The cure, think about it. Actually, there's been a decrease and the amount of carpal tunnel diagnoses. It's down, it was down by 21% in 2006, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Now, think about that. 
prior to that time and up till and continuing, we are increasing, demonstrably increasing the amount of data inputting all of us are. We all have a computer in front of us. Many of us have a pad as well and are inputting on our phones. You would think by the amount of inputting and the using of our fingers and our thumbs to continually input and act and access information, that there should be an incredible crisis of carpal tunnel if um, uh, if uh, using a keyboard is in some way dangerous when it comes to carpal tunnel. That simply is not the case. From 2005 to 2006, carpal tunnel cases have decreased by half against by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. All right, here are some additional risk factors. We talked about age fem uh, being a female, it's particularly in certain parts of the li your life, diabetes, hypothyroid, um, risk, uh, risk arthritis, risk arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, gout, systemic lupus, high, um, high demand, I'm not sure what that means, that's a typo, short stature, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, please consider providing this information to the doctor, particularly when exploring um, whether this is work-related and perhaps more importantly, when uh, um, uh, arguing in favor of apportionment. This is a nice little web of causation for carpal tunnel. I, I won't go over, go over it in any great detail other than to note that occupation over there in green is um, a very small subset of the causation character, uh, uh, causation contributors in this web. Computer users use deleted as carpal tunnel, uh, car, computer use deleted as carpal tunnel syndrome cause. As I, this is the point that I was making, but I want you to hear it from Dr. Kurt Hegman, um, an actual physician published in the Harvard University press release. Quote, clearly if keyboarding activities were a significant risk for carpal tunnel, we should have seen over the last 10 to 15 years an explosion of such cases. Uh, if keyboarding were a risk, uh, it cannot be a strong factor um, or any factor at all, it would seem. Um, other strong factors, heavy repetitive assembly use, uh, in the in assembly line, working work involving prolonged and heavy gripping, use of vibrating tools uh, such as a uh, sledgehammer or strike. That is uh, a, um, the name of the thing is uh, escaping me right now. The thing that you use that breaks up concrete. Nope, I'm never going to be able to figure it out right now. As soon as the presentation is done, I will remember this. Um, no. Okay. I promised that we would go over the appropriate testing for carpal tunnel and note this health, the health note that uh, patient health history form where it says complaint is finger numbness. Oftentimes that's pretty much what dictates the doctor's ask, uh, determination as to whether it's work related. As we suggested earlier in the earlier slide, that is not the way to do it. We need objective, objective findings. The physical exam. Yes, routine lab tests. Why would we need a blood test? Why would we need an x-ray? Well, we've already discussed that. Fractures of the small bones in the wrist could lead to the carpal tunnel and blood tests. A whole host of blood diseases and problems such as diabetes um, can lead to carpal tunnel. So we need to do that. What about the Chanel test? I know we always read about that in the reports, but what does that mean? That's where the doctor taps on the median nerve at the wrist. If there's a tingling or shock-like symptom or uh, sensation, that is an indicator of carpal tunnel. What about the failing, failing or wrist extension test? Kind of the opposite. It involves holding the elbow straight out to the left and right and flexing the hands and wrists, sort of like this right here. The position is held for a minute. You might want to try this um, at home. If the fingers after a minute um, tingle or feel numb, this is an indicator that the applicant is suffering, may be suffering from carpal tunnel. Other appropriate testing, nerve conduction velocity test with uh, use for uh, electric shocks via electrodes on the hands and uh, hands on wrists, EMGs, which uh, involves a needle stuck into the muscle to imagine, to 
to uh, measure electoral activity and can actually reveal the severity of median nerve damage, uh, which is helpful when it's determined that the carpal, if and when the tricarpal tunnel is determined to be um, uh, work related, helps to determine whether it's appropriate to undergo a, a surgical intervention if the severity of the median nerve, severity of the damage to the median nerve is insignificant or minor, there are another number of other potential um, manners in which to treat it, including rat. So there we go, carpal tunnel syndrome treatment, non-surgical splinting, medical, medical management of the disease, vitamin B6. Now I'll be honest, I have never seen a doctor in any report in 25 years talk about a B6 deficiency. Maybe you have, um, but that's certainly something we want to explore with the doctor. Corticosteroid injections into the carpal tunnel itself. Um, we certainly have lots and lots of, and, and rest, which is the obvious one. We have lots of options here before we jump right right into surgery, which is something that the doctors seem to want to oftentimes go straight to. We have endoscopic surgery and we have open surgery. And what are, we, we also have bracing, as I suggested earlier, a couple of weeks of that may be very helpful, particularly in the early stages of carpal tunnel. Medications, yeah, probably not gonna help a lot. Aspirin, ibuprofen, not particularly helpful. Uh, drugs like Celebrex that might help with uh, spasms or uh, pain in the in the back are not going to be helpful with carpal tunnel. And if we're going to use carpal car or carpal um, pills, we shouldn't do so more than one to two weeks. I talked about the injections, particularly helpful with younger patients who had a short history of complaints. Us old farts have been dealing with the symptoms forever can't expect to have a significant reduction of symptoms via these injections. Long-term benefits are actually quite mixed and oftentimes, uh, as <laughs> oftentimes the pain re returns within two to four months. Of course, when we're dealing with workers' comp, I think we always just assume the worst and that the pain's always going to be, retur be returning. So what other options do we have? Well, we have surgery. Um, what's the point? Well, we talked about carpal tunnel and why it's called tunnel and how the impinge, we have impingement of the nerve from, may caused by the small or decreasing size of the tunnel. Well, so the whole point of carpal tunnel, a carpal tunnel release, and that's what it's called, a release, uh, for good reason, is to make more space in that tunnel. And we talked about what the type, the tunnel is made up of. Remember, it's got that eight bones, little tiny bones, on the bottom of the tunnel. It makes up the floor. Uh, we've got the transverse ligament that goes over the bone and provides the roof of the tunnel. And we've got the median nerve, which is can be impacted and cause these symptoms running through that tunnel. So we want to release. We can't. Uh, we can't move the bone. So we don't want to break the bone. So the only other choice is to release the traverse ligament, loosen it up so that the median nerve can go through without, uh, without impingement. So we have two options in terms of uh, surgical treatment here. We can have an open versus endoscopic surgery. Um, the open involves about a two inch incision around the hand and wrist, wrist. And I'm sure you've seen patients friends, family who've undergone this. It's not too nasty. The good thing with doing the open procedure is you can actually see what you're doing, or that is the surgeon can see what he or she is doing. And um, it makes it a safer um, um, surgery, at least during the surgical process itself. You're not gonna hit other nerves, it's not gonna likely hit other nerves. There is a downside, however. Um, there's going to be more scarring tissue. And the uh, recovery process is going to be longer, um, they're, they're, thereby keeping the patient out of work a little bit longer and uh, on, unfortunately, temporary disability, something we want to discontinue as quickly as we can. And there we have a picture of the result of the, um, of the open release. The other alternative 
is the endoscopic surgery. Um, that's more more of a cam. Well, it, it's a small little incision in the wrist and in the palm. One in the wrist, one in the palm, and a little camera goes inside to view the damage and, more importantly, to view the car cutting cutting portion of the carpal tunnel ligament. Obviously, the advantage is much smaller, uh, much smaller uh, scarring and a speed, more speedy recovery. The negative side is, well, because you can't see the carpal tunnel and other nerves as clearly as when you actually open up the patient, there's higher risk of complication, um, more likelihood of nicking one of the other nerves um, or um, actually any one of the three nerves. And this is not a picture of an endoscopic surgery with dealing with the carpal tunnel, but nevertheless, you get the idea of being able to watch the surgery um, you know, occurring internally via a camera and a, a screen. So what are the success rates for carpal tunnel releases, whether they be endoscopic, open, or other? Believe it or not, they're very, very high. You should expect a surgical release to be um, successful. 80, 90, 80 to 90% of folks report symptom relief within six weeks. And that's once again um, to, uh, um, told to us by our friends over on the East Code by, by Harvard. So 80 to 90% relief. This should mean, of course, that in the vast majority of your files that deal with workers' compensation carpal tunnel releases, you should be expecting. A, um, a re relief and diminished significantly if um, to zero a permanent disability, right? Should be wiping out that permanent disability. Um, and you all agree with that, right? Absolutely. Um, oh, wait, 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 wait. Carpal tunnel, wake up, wake up. That's not the way it happens in California workers' compensation. All right. So, how do we rate carpal tunnel? Like I said previously, hopefully it's not work found to be work related. And if it is found to be work related, um, we've got apportionment. But if we've got an AOE COE determination, we have to know how to rate the carpal tunnel. Um, first, before we even start rating it, we really need to look at the report. Is the diagnosis accurate? Um, was it supported by appropriate electrodiagnostic studies? We've already gone through the type of studies and uh, type of investigation that should be utilized to determine whether the diagnosis is appropriate. We are all no ex uh, now all experts on this. Got to assess whether they're MMI or PMS old school. By the way, permanent and, uh, permanent and stationary. Uh, for those of you uh, in the know, means exactly what maximum medical improvement means. Although they changed the verbiage uh, back in 2005, they didn't change the meaning. Has there been an adequate time for resolution of the impairment? Believe it or not, I've seen doctors do impairment analyses three, six, eight uh, months after the surgery. Um, we should be waiting a year, according to the AMA guides. Um, why do we wait a year? Well, Theoretically, the applicant's supposed to get better after the treatment and after the wound heals. I know that's unusual in workers' compensation, but that's the actual fact. We want adequate medical documentation of the diagnosis. Are there medical reports and records an adequate history regarding past medical, past medical history and other factors such as disease, obesity, and tobacco usage? And if not, we should be subpoenaing those. And, um, now, we should be uh, not only the doctor, the PTPs, and QMEs information, um, but the applicant's uh, regular physician as well. And if they're, and I, I know applicants' attorneys have been fighting uh, subpoenas of regular physicians' information um, increasingly these days. Uh, so, what you may need to do is send a letter to your PTP uh, reminding him or her of these various other possible contributors to carpal tunnel and get a letter from them confirming that this information and then list the information we've gone over today would be relevant 
in their making the AOE COE determination and would be relevant in their making their apportionment determination. We want to assess the reliability of functional status. Are the subjective complaints of inter interference or are there um, um, are, are the subjective complaints of interference um, um, of activities of daily living accurate? Actually, what are activities of daily living? We need to remember what those eight are so we can assess whether the doctor's impairment um, and determination is accurate. We want to assess the reliability of the physical examination finding. Were the physical exam, was it, did the exam, uh, was it uh, consistent with the standards found in the guides? And yes, there are physical examination uh, constructs and uh, discussions uh, that are defined in the guides. I know we've adopted the guides solely for determining impairment, which utilizing our permanent disability rating schedule is to be converted into permanent disability. We have not, and I can hear applicants' attorneys arguing right now, we have not adopted the AMA guides, effective 1105. We've not adopted the guides to, um, to explain to the doctor or to dictate how the doctor provides a physical examination. That said, this information puts us in a strong position to question the doctor's methods of exploring the diagnosis. Determine the etiology of the carpal tunnel for proportionate purposes, as I discussed, and apply the guides, processes, and criteria um, as specified in the appropriate edition of the AMA guides. And there are many um, uh, editions of the AMA guides. We utilize the AMA guides, fifth edition, the big green book, uh, it is not the most recent book, and it is chock full of mistakes and errors. Uh, you might ask why we don't. We only use the AMA Guides fifth, and that's because the Labor Code um, announces that we're going to use it and only it. And like I indicated before, we've been using this since January 1 of 2005. Can, it, can, it, can you believe all this time has gone by? Impairment assessments. We've got a situation where 1,762 carpal tunnel releases were analyzed. That, what do I mean by that? I mean that it was determined whether or not the doctors had actually properly applied the AMA guide. It was found that 69% of the time, the doctors analyzing carpal tunnel for purposes uh, or, or utilizing the AMA guides for carpal tunnel purposes, they were wrong 69% of the time using the fifth edition and 62% of the time with the sixth edition. Uh, so uh, given that we still use, as I just indicated, the fifth edition, that 69% number applies to us. Where do we find carpal tunnel and, cor and uh, compression neuropathy discussions in the AMA guide? Uh, it's fairly brief, and I recommend it. It's a good, it's a good read, pages 491 to 495. By the way, uh, it's also called a compression neuropathy because that's exactly what carpal tunnel is. Um, as I suggested earlier, they uh, it, not only does it describe uh, how to diagnose, strike that, how to provide an accurate uh, impairment determination, but how how also to do the examination. You must have a quote objectively verifiable diagnosis. Quote not only on believable symptoms, not just if the applicant is complaining and it sounds right, but more important on the presence of positive clinical findings and loss of function, all of which we've just gone over. The diagnosis should be documented. And these quotes, by the way, represent that they're found in your AMA guides. The diagnosis should be documented by electromyographic studies, as well as sensory and motor conduction studies. And we're going to see in a second that um, the evaluation of permanent impairment is based on sensory and motor um, information. So we must have uh, the uh, electromyographic studies to evaluate uh, how much impairment is appropriate. Um, Normal sensibility, opposition strength, nerve conjunction studies would give us a zero. Normal sensibility and strength with abnormal sensory and or motor latencies or EMG would provide no greater than 5% upper extremity impairment, in other words, 3%. Positive clinical findings of the median nerve dysfunction and electrical conduction delays um, we can go anywhere from 0% and expect 0% for carpal tunnel um, 
not to exceed 5% or 3% WPI, or um, in the worst case scenario, oh, in the worst case scenario, well, we'll get to that later. I thought it was in here. We're going to go through examples. All right. If after an optimal recovery time following the surgery, the applicant continues to be symptomatic, um, we're going to need further tests. And what does that mean? Positive clinical findings of the, mental, of the median nerve dysfunction and electrical con conduction delay. Impairment due to residual CTS is rated according to the sensory and motor deficits. So note that positive clinical findings of the, of the nerve uh, dysfunction and electrical conduction delay. There's object, there needs to be objective findings in order to do, utilize this third methodology. Uh, for evaluating the impairment of, of carpal tunnel. And you'll notice here are the values of various um, nerves in the upper extremity. And you only have three, as we discussed. You've got radial, and you've got, you've got radial, you've got ulnar, um, and the most important is the median nerve. The median nerve is worth 39% upper extremity in its sensory ability, that is, how it, things feel, and it has 10% upper extremity. That is in terms of how you grip. Um, combined together, it's worth 45% upper extremity maximally. In other words, in other words, if you um, cut the uh, the median nerve and it is no longer use now useless, the value of that damage or the impairment. Uh, assessment is going to be 45% upper extremity. There we go. You can see it a little bit better here. 45% upper extremity. Um, identify the specific portion of the median nerve involved. Do not automatically rate for a loss of the entire median nerve. And that's very often the case. Doctors say, well, we're just going to give them the value of the entire median nerve. But that's not, that's not accurate. Remember, the median nerve enervates different parts rather different fingers um, and different parts of the digits. Um, if all of the uh, areas that the nerve is supposed to innervate are Im impacted, then we can use the, the, uh, uh, use the larger number. But if not, we should be using a smaller number. So um, we, we said that we're going to evaluate based on sensory loss of the median nerve and uh, motor loss of the median nerve. Here is a description of the sensory losses. In short, these are the descriptions of what the doctor is going to have to identify to determine how much, has, how much loss has been suffered. Um, no, sense, no loss of sensibility, no abnormal sensation or pain. This would represent a grade five or 0% sensory deficit. Um, in other words, for purposes of sensory loss, the applicant would get no impairment. Number four, the, neck, the next best thing, distorted superficial tactile sensibility, in short, diminished light touch with or without abnormal sensations or pain that is sort of forgotten with activity. That would represent one to 25% loss of the sensory ability of the nerve. Um, and finally, number three, Distorted superficial tactile sensibility, diminished light touch with two-point discrimination, some abnormal sensations or slight pain that interferes with some activity. That represents 26 to 60% loss of the sensory capacity of that nerve. Remember, the sensory capacity of that nerve is worth 39% upper extremity. A um, couple of things. First, that the vast majority of people should fall in these first categories, five, four, three. Um, a, ca a category zero means that the nerve has been completely sliced and it's completely useless. Um, um, also, look at these uh, ranges, one to 25%, 26 to 60%. Um, these are awfully wide ranges. Unfortunately, they are completely subjective and totally left up to the doctor. Um, to make the determination as to where along the line the applicant uh, falls, 
26 to 6 percent, 1 to 25 percent, 61 to 80 percent. That's the bad news. The good news is we're le dealing with such small numbers that um, it's not going to make a significant difference. Also, one last point before we go from the slide, the two-point uh, discrimination, that involves a test where the applicant looks away and the doctor takes two sharp points, not too terribly pointy, but uh, too sharp, but two points and um, sticks them onto the applicant's finger or hand, wherever it is that they claim that they've lost uh, sensory ability. And the doctor starts with the points very close together and ask, do you feel one point or two points? And if they're very close together, they'll, they'll, they'll only be able to feel one point. And the further apart they get, the more likely that the applicant will be able to dis discern that there are two points that they're being pricked with as opposed to one. At, when they, um, at the precise point that they can feel the two-point tactile discrimination, is where um, the, the measurement, med, the measurement uh, is. Um, some information that we've received from the guide newsletter, which is a nice read and I recommend it to you. Examining self-reports are often unreliable. No big surprise there. Anybody who's been doing rec um, workers' comp for a day and a half knows that. Knows that. Based on objective sensory findings as explicitly found in the AMA guide, they were, we require the two-point discrimination that I, I just mentioned and the sensibility testing. All right, so we've just looked at the, the manner in which we're going to analyze or the doctor's going to analyze the loss of sensory capacity of the um, median nerve. Um, that's that nerve that's worth 39% upper extremity. Now we're going to look at the way the doctor is going to grade the motor capacity of the um, of the median nerve, the m m the uh, motor capacity of the median nerve is worth 10% upper extremity, and at a grade five, it re reflects that they have a complete active range of motion against gravity with resistance. In other words, they've lost no capacity, no um, the the strength of the fingers and hand have n have not been uh, uh, decrease. That would be a zero and they would receive no impairment capacity. A grade four, complete active range of motion against gravity with some resistance, one to 25 percent. Um, that is going to cover the vast majority of your cases. Um, number three, complete active range of motion against gravity only without resistance. Think about it. The applicant can't move their fingers um, if there's anything in the way, they can't move a piece of paper out of the way or a small, um, a small weight. Um, this is going to be a surgical disaster. Um, so as you can see, it's, it's going to be a grade five or a grade four in the vast majority of your cases. You should know, um, even without getting a doctor's in, uh, insights and testing results, if you're dealing with something that's worse than a five or four. And then, of course, there's a zero down here, no evidence of contractility. In short, they just don't move. Um, assume if you're in one of these that you're going to get a di diagnosis of um, a CRPS. Um, something well worth remembering, this grade four, um, as I suggested, covers most everything. That is actually what the AMA guide says about grade four, this one at 25 percent. Grade four covers a wide range of weakness from minimal detectable weakness to severe weakness in which the muscles are functional through a wide range um, with only very slight resistance. And let's take a look at this. Let's say it's a grade four and let's give it um, the word which you know, again, you, unless they're perfect, you're going to get a grade four. And let's say um, it's the doctor gives them the worst number, 25%. Remember that uh, the uh, value, the median nerve's value is only 10% upper extremity. So 25% times 10% or one quarter of 10% is going to be 2.5% upper extremity. Um, we're dealing with very, very small numbers. So, 
what's the maximum value? Let's say the median nerve has been destroyed. Surgery went very, very poorly. We said that sensory grade zero means 100% loss. Motor grade zero means 100% loss of the motor ability. The maximum values of the median nerve, we already talked about that. The sensory value is 39% upper extremity, and the motor value is 10% upper extremity. 100% total loss of 39% upper extremity is, of course, 39% UE. 100% loss of the motor capacity, or 10% UE, equals, of course, 10% UE. We combine those two, 39% combined with 10%, um, and convert it to 49% upper extremity. Then we need to transform this 40% 45% upper extremity into what? That's right, whole person impairment. What's it worth? 27% whole impairment. In short, let's revisit this. If you destroy the median nerve, the worst case scenario for an upper extremity is 27% whole person impairment. So here are our choices. Everything's great, 0%. Things are slightly funky, 3%. And we have to do the sensory motor capacity analysis that we've just done, 27%. Error rates, lots of problems with the fifth edition. The diagnosis of the carpal tunnel not confirmed by reliable di electrodiagnostics that we discussed earlier. Unreliable functional reports, as we discussed earlier. Unreliable sensory or motor evaluation. Reliance on software, garbage in, garbage out. Be careful. If you see a doctor utilizing a computer program, I virtually guarantee we can find problems with it. Um, factors included not permitted by the guide, such as double dipping. Uh, for those of you who've been doing California workers' compensation for far too long, you'll recall that carpal tunnel was always, virtually, always um, in the bad old days, analyzed using grip strength. We no longer use grip strength. And in fact, it is specifically and expressly prohibited by the AMA guides. But I still see, we see at the AMA guides rating department, see doctors double dipping and utilizing grip, grip strength to justify an increase in the impairment. Then there we go. In compression neuropathies, additional impairment values are not given for grip strength. The guides um, for grip strength so expressly states, we don't use that. The guides does not assign a large role to such measurements. And by that, it means in other analyses, in other types of injuries. But specifically, with carpal tunnel, the guides are expressly state, in compression neuropathies, additional impairment is not given for decreased strength. Red flags. Watch out for additional values based on decreased pin strength, as I just suggested, decreased grip strength, um, motor deficits of a specific nerve structure, sensory deficits due to a digital nerve lesion, not a, the median nerve. In compression neuropathies, additional impairments are not given for decreased strength, decreased uh, grip strength. Okay, I've said that three times, and I probably should say it three more times because of the number of times that doctors um, misapply and do that. The maximum value for each grade is not applied automatically. Recall when I said we um, in the sensory and motor ranges, well in the sensory I said that we had a 1 to 25 percent range, um, they had a wide ranges that the doctor could determine when assessing the degree of sensory loss and the degree of motor loss. And I also mentioned that doctors automatically oftentimes just apply the bigger number. Um, well, the AMA guides make clear that this is inappropriate. Here's a quick example. We have a left upper extremity injury, post-carpal tunnel release, 14 months. So we are now in the, should be in the MMI stage. And indeed, they are MMI. There's a diminished light, light touch, fair to good two-point discrimination of eight millimeters. Pain is, quote unquote, forgotten during activity. And recall, this is the language that's used in the AMA guides. They have complete range of motion with some resistance. You'll re remember that this is a grade four. So we've got a grade four for sensory and grade four for motor. What are the ranges here? Well, here's our median nerve. 
39% and 10% for motor. And grade four uh, for sensory is one to 25%. So we're gonna be one to 25% of 39%. And here is 10% deficit of what of the maximum sensory value. As I've just indicated, the maximum sensory value of the median nerve is 39% upper extremity. So 10% loss of 39% upper extremity is 3.9% is 3 upper extremity. As for the motor, um, the grade is 1 to 25%. We said, doctor, you're not allowed to use automatically use the 25%. And the doctor actually listened here and gave us a mere 20%. Um, we, did, we decided what the maximum value the motor value of an upper of a median nerve is it is 10% upper extremity, um, and let's say so we've lost 20% of the 10% upper extremity. This equates to 2% upper extremity. What do we do? We're going to combine the sensory loss 4% upper extremity with the motor loss 2% upper extremity, and we're going to combine them at the upper extremity level. Four combined with six with two is going to equal 6% upper extremity. What do we do now? We have to convert it to whole person impairment. It's a more, mere 4% whole person impairment. Remember, this is one of the worst situations we have. We have three different uh, ways of me uh, measuring carpal tunnel. The first says is carpal tunnel impairment. The first comes up with 0%. The second is 0 to 3%. And in this case, the worst case scenario, is one to 39%. This particular case, and this example here, is very um, um, typical of what the doctor should be providing us. Quick thought for the day. Medical literature suggests most cases of previously, la previously labeled as occupationally related were neither caused nor aggravated by work. Um, and apportionment must always be evaluated based on the set, based on the facts available. One last point, operating on a hand will not cure a bad job um, or, or a wounded spirit, or more importantly, greed, which we see both, well, we see it from a, coming from a lot of parties. Um, any questions? Any qu Ah, Tammy has just come into my office and mentioned that the word I was looking for, or words I was looking for, were jackhammer. I want to thank you very much. <laughs> I would not have remembered. Anyway, we are at uh, we're at the break. Thank you very much for joining us. I'm going to put you on with Tammy one more time and have a wonderful evening and afternoon and evening. Thanks.